Hello and welcome to Antipedia. Today we will study how to manage information system. Join us. In today's lesson we will analyze how trustworthy the information systems we work with are, since we rely heavily on them for personal, business or public administration activities. But would not it be alright to start working and just worry about what to do when something goes wrong? It may not be the wisest thing to do, Bob. Imagine that the systems that control power supply, hospitals, trains and so on, were to fail suddenly one day. We can't just improvise. The same goes for the confidentiality and integrity of our data. It's too late to avoid an incident, when it's already happened and we could even be accused of negligence. Alright, I understand that the problem could be serious. But it seems to me that there are a thousand possible scenarios. Mistakes made by us or by our suppliers. Natural disasters. People interested in stealing, spying, etc. The responsibility doesn't end because it's someone else's fault. Whosoever fault it is. The important thing is to tackle the consequences. When it isn't possible to anticipate the events, the professional thing to do is to prepare action plans that mitigate incidents and provide alternative solutions. I think that is all relative. You're right. Each information system serves a particular business and the person in charge of that business knows what they want to protect and from what or from whom. Although there are general measures that can cover almost everyone, there are cases in which the measures will need some adapting. For such a task, incident impact analysis can be very helpful. Impact assessment involves imagining the consequences of an incident, be it accidental, or deliberate, in order to answer questions like, what happens if confidential information is revealed? What happens if our information is misused? What if our service is cut for some hours? Wow, and so how can we measure that? More than measuring, we should ask the person responsible for the information or in charge of the service. In risk analysis, this estimate of the impact is an input data. Sometimes the figure is known because of legislation or binding contractual obligations. An example of this is the regulation concerning personal data protection. There are also service obligations, like in the case of the electricity or telephone networks. And other examples can be found in a business strategy given by the management. That doesn't sound very technical. Because it isn't. It's a matter of management. It's usually more important to know the damage that could result from a breach in security than to know the cost of the actual information system. Okay, now that we know what would happen if something went wrong, what can we do about it? We can analyze the scenarios and that's what is called risk analysis. This isn't an easy task, to say the least. It's very arduous because the systems are very rich in components and the possible scenarios multiply. Think about it. Some people add more and more equipment and functions without realizing that what is an opportunity for their business might be an opportunity for others to take advantage or perhaps a source for potential problems. So I imagine we must begin with a good inventory and I guess that means understanding the business and knowing what information is being handled and what services are being provided. Furthermore, we'll have to know what equipment we've installed and probably the communications. Am I right? Spot on, Bob. Under the assets, don't forget to include other sources of problems, such as facilities and people that interact with the system. To consider people as an asset may sound odd at first. But experience tells us that there are more problems caused by internal staff making mistakes or wanting to cause damage than from technical failures. Sorry Alice, but more than solutions, it looks like you love problems. Aren't you being a little ominous? Well, one thing is to analyze everything that we anticipate might happen, and another is to put it in perspective. After making an inventory of the assets and threats, we must qualify every possible scenario to understand its impact and risk. The impact is what we talked about earlier, the consequences for the business in hand. 
and the risk goes a step further classifying the incidents according to their chances of happening. With these estimates, we can prioritize risks and focus on the most likely things and or those with the worst consequences. Alice, the words impact and risk seem quite substantial. And they are. Sometimes they're called security status indicators and help in decision making. Impact measures what can happen while risk measures what will probably happen. Alice, suppose that I'm worried for the risk or impact of a certain scenario. What could I do? There are four typical ways of dealing with risks. The first is to avoid the situation, second to mitigate the danger, third to pass it on to another person and fourth to accept the situation. The first step is to ask ourselves if we need everything we have. For example, to have a public web server on our database server may be a way of offering a great service to our customers but it also opens the door to possible information leaks or thefts. We would be handing it on a platter to thieves. To avoid this, we can separate the production server from the public access server, so the risk scenario is different. The second measure is to mitigate the impact. The risk or both the risk can be mitigated with preventive measures. For example, encrypting the hard drive reduces the chances of information ending up in the wrong hands. If you lose your laptop in a taxi, the impact can be reduced with reactive or recovery measures. For example, if you have backups, you don't prevent a file from getting lost or a database server from breaking down, but you know that you can recover quickly and continue working. Before, you mentioned accepting risks. That sounds crazy. Who would want to accept a risk? Accepting risks is part of our everyday decisions. We have to balance risks and potential benefits. Many of us take planes despite the risk of a crash and we set up online stores because we believe that the profit from e-commerce outweighs the risk of fraud. Once again, these decisions are part of business management. A technician can't make them, they must be made by the management. Many activities entail taking risks to achieve a certain profit. What risk analysis provides is the information to know what is at stake and be able to make informed decisions. I see. You also mentioned passing the risk on to another person. That sounds strange. It might have been the way I said it. To take out insurance is a form of passing the risk to the insurer. To subcontract a service with a service level agreement is a way of passing the risk on to the provider. These are conventional measures that work out well when everyone wins with a deal. Note that horizontal services spread the risk. Since they involve many customers, if your house burns, your loss is huge. But for the insurer, it's just one burnt house amongst thousands of insured houses. So it works out for both parties. Curiously, it is now very common to speak of risk sharing, the stressing that the issue concerns all the parties, and that the goal is to place the risk in the right place. There are many variations of the agreements between parties. I see we have four options then. Eliminate. Mitigate, transfer or accept. Some options seem technical and others don't, with very different costs. In the end, is it a matter of money? It's a matter of resource management. Technical, human and economic decisions are made in view of the consequences and the cost of the solution. Risk analysis ranks the consequences and you decide how many resources can be justified for the solution. In the end, we must reach a balance. The maxim to remember is that the cost of the protective measures must not be higher than the value of the protected asset. How interesting. But I imagine that the risk analysis isn't valid forever, is it? In my company there are information systems that haven't changed in years. In a dynamic world, the risk analysis must be as dynamic as the world, because the context often changes. The risk isn't something that only concerns you. The risk analyses, what can happen to your system when it faces a certain environment. Changes in the environment must be followed carefully, not only because of attackers but because each change in legislation or in industry practices makes it necessary to perform a new analysis. It is important to be very agile and very fast. It's better to have a broad risk analysis than a perfect analysis. Risk management is to make structural decisions. The details are to address specific incidents. Alice, let's see if I can summarize it. First, we make an inventory of our assets. 
Second, we analyze the incidents that may occur. Third, we add security measures. Then, we calculate the impact and risk. With that, we make the decision of accepting it or modifying any aspect of the system, which leads us to making a further analysis. And that is recurrent. On the one hand, we must make immediate decisions, and on the other, we must adapt to the changes made either by us or the environment. You've summed it up very well, Bob. Now, we have to be methodical so as to not miss anything. Don't forget that unexpected things are hidden risks for which we are not prepared. Alice, there's something that worries me. It seems to me that risk analyses are very high-level exercises in which we abstract functional details and focus on the system value for the business. Am I right? Indeed. The analysis can be detailed, but often it isn't. For example, suppose we set up a system with recovery computer sessions in a second computer, in case the main one fails. Technically, it is a complex assembly, but from a security point of view, it is greatly simplified. Confidentiality and integrity of information must remain the same on all computers. And the availability is limited to imposing a maximum time of service interruption. That's what I imagined. But the consequence of this is that we are highly dependent on the analyst's craft. And, I don't know. But when it comes to security, craftsmanship gives me the chills. And you are right to feel like that, Bob. I don't think that risk analysis is 100% independent from the analyst. This is a consulting business that has a not-so-insignificant human factor. What you need to do is follow a method so that the analysis can be approved and always be prepared to explain the conclusions. And is there a universal method for this? Yes, there is considerable consensus about ISO standards for risk analysis that set out a series of frames for naming and activities. Of course, these rules are not limited to information security. They also unify different types of risks in order to make decisions by combining work risks, financial risks, technical risks, environmental risks and so on. Okay. Now I get it. I understand then that the analyst's creativity can be channeled, for example, using tools that impose a method. Is that possible? Yes, of course. In fact, carrying out a risk analysis without tools is nearly heroic. In any case, it would be impossible to maintain and make the appropriate marginal analysis for the constant changes of the system and the environment. In Spain, the public administration has been leading efforts for several years to analyze and manage risks in information systems. The reason is none other than the administrative process and the administration's activities. As a result of this concern, we can highlight Mudgerit and Peeler. Mudgerit is a practical guide to analyze and manage risks within the ISO framework. And Peeler is a tool that helps manage the volume of information required by a professional risk analysis. Both instruments have surpassed the public administration and are used in all kinds of scenarios simply adjusting the type of information and services to each individual case. How interesting. I have learned a lot about risks. It looks like anticipating incidents is going to make us think a lot. On the Entipedia website there's additional documentation for this lesson. See you later. Goodbye.